Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining today's SICK webinar hosted by Heart Energy. My name is Brian Walzell, Senior Editor at Heart Energy. And today we will be discussing how to improve operational efficiency and reduce upstream loss and account for gas. Representing SICK today is Dwayne Harris, a Market Product Manager for SICK for Process Automation. With over 30 years in the industry, Dwayne brings a wealth of experience as a Vice President of Business Development and Support for FlowCal for 17 years, and as a General Manager, General Manager at Panhandle Energy for 17 years. Also with us today is Irvin Schwarzenberg, Market Application Engineer at SICK for the Process Automation Industry. For nearly seven years, Irvin has provided his expertise in flow products to assist customers with finding the best technology for their application. During the webinar, please feel free to use the questions feature in your control panel, and our host will address them during the Q&A after the presentation. And now, I will hand things over to Dwayne. Uh, thank you, Brian. Really greatly appreciate the introduction and, and also greatly appreciate Heart Energy uh, for bringing this topic uh, to our industry today. Uh, you know, in, without, again, I, I'd like to thank each of y'all for investing your time with us. Time is a precious uh, commodity, and we just greatly uh, appreciate you investing that time with us. So as, as we dive in, what are we going to walk through today? Uh, if, if we take and we look, we're, we're going to walk through, you know, some information about SICK, our organization. Uh, we're going to talk about the history of ultrasonic meter technology. We're going to walk through some advantages of that meter technology. Uh, we're also going to address some specific upstream measurement issues uh, for the upstream area. And then we've got a number of case studies that will really kind of show you uh, some examples of what customers have seen and issues customers have kind of walked through that trying to address some of the you know mechanical measurement devices and, and equipment that they've operated with for years out in the field. Uh, and, and then one of the things that you're really kind of looking forward to is the summary and some Q&A at the very, very end. So next, you know, taking and looking at just some information uh, about our organization. So, so from, from SICK, the company, uh, our, we, we've got a broad portfolio that is in our industry today. You know, for us, we are focused on factory, logistics, and process automation. And with our focus in those three areas, it gives us the ability to really uh, provide solutions that are targeted in these specific areas of industry that provide automation uh, that great, provides great benefit and value to our customers. The other key thing is our universe really only consists of industrial application, uh, industrial applications. And for us today, just like what Brian had mentioned, we are focused on process automation. So if we dive in a little bit further and we take and we look, we've got a wide product uh, portfolio with that is focused from a, a technology perspective that provide innovative solutions to our customers. And we do that through these nine global business centers. And the global business center that uh, Urban and I are, are based out of is flow measurement. And so we'll be spending some time today uh, from the flow measurement side, kind of walking through how we provide some innovative solutions to provide value to customers, specifically today in the upstream segment in flow measurement. So if, if we kind of, as we continue to, to walk forward, you know, the, the question is, is, is what is the focus? Why care, let's say, about flow measurement? So one of the huge benefits and why uh, flow measurement is critical for upstream areas, for upstream measurement, is this is specifically where gas is turned into dollars. And that is from several different ways. You know, one way is that is specifically where royalties are paid. Uh, that is where allocations are made. And in addition to that, generally speaking, that is where the value of gas is really established. Then from there, as, as organizations continue to move, decisions, financial decisions are made about the life cycle of those upstream assets and those formations based quite often on the measurement. I mean, what is the throughput? What are we pulling out of the ground? And so what are we going to continue to develop further? What are we going to for sure maintain? 
And then what assets do we really desire that we want to, to dispose of? And so the goal is really for the best possible measurement with respect to the need of the application that you're working in. And so all of those have got to factor into the decisions that an organization makes going forward. So one of the, the, the next areas, you know, for, for me, you know, one of my life passions is truly measurement integrity. Measurement integrity to me is really one of the, the key areas of focus in our industry that we operate in today. And so whenever we talk about measurement integrity, there's four words that oftentimes are brought up in association with measurement integrity. And so one of them is measurement uncertainty. And whenever you talk about measurement uncertainty, there is, you know, the, the GUM, G-U-M, the guide to the expression of uncertainty in measurement. And, and if you dive into those books that are uh, great reading, but if, if you dive into those books and those manuals, what it relates to is if you take and you look at uncertainty, uncertainty is the true value of uncertainty lies between a stated measurement range. And so if you're looking at that stated measurement range, well, then what is the accuracy? You know, the accuracy is the closeness of the agreement between the measured quantity values, okay, and the true quantity value that is of, of the measure and. And what is the measure and? The measure and is the quantity intended to be measured. And so that is, you know, one of the key terms that, that relates to accuracy. In addition to that, what, what follows quite often is, well, is your measurement repeatable? You know, how repeatable is those values? Is your measurement reproducible? And that is another key area that, that focus into the actual accuracy that, tie, that ties into uncertainty. And so with that, I've got four different kinds of views uh, that I like for us to kind of quickly walk through. And so this first shows you measurement that is very precise and unbiased. In this next view, what you see here is the measurement is not biased. It is still, we're measuring in the center, but if you notice, we're not near as accurate. We are imprecise in the measurement that we're able to derive on those values. In this next set that we're looking at, you know, we've, we're very precise. We've got a very tight grouping of measured results. But with that data, what we've noticed is now we're biased. If our goal is to be in the center, we're, we're not in the center. We're off to the right. We, we've missed our mark somewhat. And then the last area is we've got the same kind of bias that we were looking at just before. But in addition to that, now we're not as accurate. We're not as precise or imprecise. And so these are four different views that you have to always kind of consider of what you're looking at with your measured results. And so what is always the desired outcome? Always the desired outcome is really being able to be precise and unbiased. And that's one of the key things that Urban and I are, are trying to walk through and visit with you today on uh, with the information that we're presenting. So the, the next area that I'd like for us to kind of cover and walk through is what is the history of ultrasonic measurement? Well, you know, ultrasonic measurement has really been around since the 1960s. And so in, in reality, it's about, it's about as old as I am. And so, you know, some people might think that I'm very old, some people might think I'm very young, but started goes, goes back to the 1960s. Uh, ultrasonic measurement really gained a foothold uh, in the, the late 1990s. And, and I was plugged into the industry during that time, saw ultrasonic measurement, uh, actually knocking on the door and coming in. And, and, and from there, what you saw, it was primary focus on gas transmission measurement, large receipt points, large delivery points, very large volume of throughput, and relatively clean, dry gas. And that is exactly what you saw moving through the majority of the meters that were initially implemented. Since that time, what we have seen is technology advances that have continued to expand the way that we're able to apply this technology for ultrasonic measurement in, in more of an upstream, downstream, other types of areas. And we're gonna you 
you know, focus a little bit more on the upstream uh, topic as we go forward. But what I'd like for us to, to for sure do is understand what is the operating principle behind, behind ultrasonic meters. And so, Erwin, would you like to dive into that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dwayne. So just a, a quick, uh, you know, dispel, uh, dispel the magic of ultrasonics. So, you know, real quick, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about ultrasonics in two minutes or less. But, <laughs> really, but I did want to show you the basis for the technology. You know, really, the, the beauty of ultrasonic is its simplicity. So if you take a piece of pipe, <clears throat> add a speaker, receiver, and stopwatch, that's really the main components of an ultrasonic. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, but it's it really is kind of that simple. <clears throat> In schools, we like to teach the concept of an ultrasonic uh, as an analogy to a boat on the water. So you put a boat on a still lake with no moving water, and you go from A to B, turn the boat around, see how long it takes, go from B back to A some point, and you know, it's going to take the same amount of time. Well, the water's not moving, but you take that same boat and you put it on a slow moving river and it's going to go downstream a little quicker so a to b is going to be five seconds b to a it's going to take longer maybe eight seconds so you get this delta t and of course the faster the water moves the bigger the time difference from going upstream and downstream and really you take that time difference a little bit of math you can come up with a velocity and in our world if you get a velocity in feet per second you know the cross-sectional area of the pipe feet squared you get cubic feet that's really it. So, you know, we're not sending boats across, but we send sound waves across. And if we can get sound across the pipe to the other sensor, we can measure time. We can get time. We can get velocity, velocity cross sectional area, we can get ACF. So, the heart of the SICK ultrasonics is this transducer. The SICK is a leader in several sensor technologies, and ultrasonic is no different. We're a leader in that technology. Our sensor is robust tend to last forever and extremely efficient in getting the sound energy into the gas and then sensing at the receiver. And remember, if we can get the sound across and we can hear it, we can calculate a velocity, get a velocity, you can get the AC out. So an ultrasonic is a very, very simple device, no magic, strong principles, very robust, very reliable, and no moving parts. Awesome. Thank you. So the, the next area that I'd like for us to kind of walk through is diving into just a summary of, you know, what standards relate to ultrasonic measurement technology. And so if we go back uh, to June of 1998, which was which is whenever the first edition of AGA-9 was released, and, and that really kind of set the stage for, for the, the very beginning kind of foundation uh, for a standard for uh, custody transfer ultrasonic measurement. That then was reprinted in June of 2000 uh, as a reprint of the first edition. The second edition actually showed up in April of 2007. And then you've got the, uh, in 2017, July of 2017, the third edition was published. And so what are some of those changes? What are some of the nuances that are incorporated into the July 2017 uh, third edition report. And what you see is, is really some focus on performance requirements. Another area is uh, in the associated with calibration requirements. And then the, the last area is, is really diving in and focusing on some installation requirements. So from those areas, and this is something that from an AGA-9 perspective, uh, that committee is still continuing to meet they're continuing to move the standards associated with custody transfer ultrasonic measurement forward. And so I would envision here within a couple of years, two, two to three years, you'll see an actual update again, that would be the fourth edition of, of this update. And so this is something that is a living process. Uh, I encourage you, if you have a desire to, to plug into that and, and, and make you know this process continue to go forward as it relates to standards and ultrasonic measurement technology. The next thing that I would like for us to really kind of cover is, you know, what are some of the advantages? What are some of the benefits that you get with ultrasonic measurement technology? And so the, the first is you've got a high degree of accuracy, plus or minus 0.33%. You know, you've got a repeatability. You know, we we're talking about how repeatability is important. And so repeatability, you're looking at 
a, a plus or minus 0.1%. You know, you've got a high turndown ratio. And in here in a little bit, Urban's going to spend some more time talking about turndown ratios. But, you know, the benefit of the throughput that you're able to move from the low side to the high side through a meter, you know, you're able to easily see 100 to 1. There are times that you can easily see a 160 to 1. And so that, that brings great benefit to customers with the investment that they make in the meters that they actually have out in the field. You've got no, no moving parts. And so with that, you know, it's naturally bi-directional. Uh, it's very tolerant of wet gas applications. And that is something that, that you see that's, that's more new as we understand this, this technology in our industry. You've got negligible pressure loss that is a great benefit. You know, whenever you've got to invest money in compression, you know, having something out in the field that does, doesn't cause any restriction in the pressure provides value to you and your organization. And then the, the last thing I wanted to, to make sure and hit that is a huge benefit, and that is the, the real-time diagnostics that you're able to see that tells you where problems exist on a real-time type basis within your organization. Then you may ask, well, where do you find, you know, ultrasonic meters in the industry today? And so you know, in the beginning, we were talking about like that midstream area. You saw a number of, of ultrasonic meters that initially were, were deployed in the midstream area. As we have moved forward, you see that hitting in the downstream area with the FS500, you've got the FS600 Classic, you've got the FS600 XT. You've got FS100 flare meters that are also incorporated midstream. And then as we move into the upstream side on the production, the gas gathering side, now you're starting to see a, a DRU meter. You're also seeing, you know, FS600s uh, deployed. And you, in addition to that, you see flare meters, FS100. So with these suite of products, you know, one of the things that you can, you can be guaranteed of, and that is whenever you look the gas that ends up at a burner tip, especially on the downstream side, you can be guaranteed that gas has gone through an ultrasonic meter at least once, if not twice, and potentially multiple times from, from being measured you know, at the wellhead, going through the transmission lines, going all the way through the distribution system, all the way to your home. And so the, there is a great degree of benefit by really diving in and looking at ultrasonic meters. So now we're going to kind of transition a little bit uh, and diving in more focused on the upstream side. And as we, as we do that, you know, what are some real challenges that you encounter on the upstream side of measurement? Because, you know, one of the things that you see from a midstream side is, you know, they are typically operating with clean, dry gas. Well, did the gas start out that way? No, it didn't. So one of the key things that you've got to do is you've got to have water that is removed. So there's a, a lot of time and effort that is spent on ensuring integrity with water removal. In addition to that, you've got separation of natural gas liquids. You, you know, you've got a lot of fields that have got that are very heavy in NGLs. And so that natural gas liquids, that heavy in, you generally want to separate that out from the gas so that you now have the heavies that are stripped out that have their own value and are priced as a commodity as you strip those out. In addition to that, you've got some um, areas of some contaminants. I mean, you may have sulfur, you may have CO2, you may have other types of contaminants that you've got to remove from that gas stream. And so all of that is focused in that upstream gathering area that, that you've got to deal with all those types of anomalies. As you begin to, to do that, you know, there are challenges that you quite often will encounter out in the field. And that is, you know, the closer you move to the wellhead, the, the closer you have moved to debris. And so, you know, the, the picture that you see right here, whether, you know, that it, it's in your situation, it may have been a pig, it may have been a rag, um, you know, you've got some kind of debris, it could have even been a rock that, that hit your office plate, uh, but you've got some kind of debris that has hit the, the, your, your, your office meter. And whenever that occurs, it is very difficult 
quite often to determine exactly where this issue is. And so normally you have got a team that spends a wealth of time going from site to site. And, and you know, normally it's not just one issue, you've got several of these types of issues. So it would be a great opportunity if a specific meter would cry out and let you know, hey, I, I've got a problem. But that is, you know, some of the issues and anomalies that occur in the upstream area and sector of our business. So, Irvin, kind of an introduction to this application. Would you like to kind of walk through this? Yeah, sure. So, there uh, in the upstream world, there's several places that you need uh, to measure gas. So, you know, they present themselves in the upstream market. So, starting at the wellhead, of course, the raw fluid comes out. Usually, makes the first stop at a separator, and then uh, you know, it'll pull that off the, the first pass to getting the liquids off. And then what happens is uh, a lot of times today we have multi-pad sites. They'll recombine that gas and they'll uh, let it leave the pad. So it'll go into a gathering system. So quite often there's a pad meter there. Um, and, uh, you know, then it, it's going to go down to the, the local gas plant. Or, and usually on the other side of the gathering line, there's a place where you're going to uh, measure the gas. And then... In some cases, there's gas injection, so you might turn around and send some of that gas back for gas lift. And uh, of course, in the in the measurement upstream market, uh, you know, there's always opportunity for flares too. And uh, while we have a flow sick 100 that can address that, you know, that's really a discussion for another day. But <laughs> the measurement points for the upstream flow measurement, um, really, you know, each one of these, you want something that's reliable uh, under challenging process conditions, uh, you know, so ultrasonics, no moving parts, they just tend to work. Um, they have a large measuring span. Of course, on upstream, there's always fluctuating rates, a well comes on, a well comes off. Yeah, it's not nice and smooth like a large transmission pipeline. And of course, uh, the, the always present cost effectiveness, you know, that there's, Technologies out there that might be fun to use, but are they cost effective? And really, you know, when you're dealing with the upstream, just from the sheer number of measurement points, you really need to pay attention to capex and opex. And really, uh, we feel that the SICK ultrasonic meters uh, can really address that these days uh, for these measurement points, as well as, you know, taking care of the concerns that you have when you're dealing with upstream measurement. Thanks, Wayne. Very good. Thanks, Irvin. And so the, the next area that we're, we're going to dive into and it's probably some of the information that if you joined us today, this is what you're really wanting to kind of see because it, it's a case study. It's, it's information that we have been able to receive uh, and, and collect that provides kind of a, a picture and an illustration of some real life type scenarios that have gone on. And so the case study that we're going to walk through the first one is, is really there's, there's an organization and, and they started kind of scratching their heads and asking themselves, you know what, what are the real benefits if we move to a full ultrasonic meter field solution? You know, would that really provide value to us? And so from that, you know, they wanted to kind of then, you know, you know scoping that out, if they decided to proceed, you know, they, they would have to develop a field study you know, to, to learn and see what the effects of, of introducing ultrasonic meters would be for their, their field. You know, how, how would that be done? How would that be rolled out? You know, how could they incorporate that? You know, they would then have to review what those results were to then kind of determine, is there a real benefit that we could gain from that? And so, uh, you know, from there, what would the next steps, you know, they would have to kind of develop, you know, a, a retrofit plan to implement this, to fully transition, you know, this, this organization in the beginning that they were, what they were looking at, had like a, around 120 meters. And, and with these 120 meters, you know, transitioning that from orifice measurement to ultrasonic measurement, you know, what would that look like? And so, you know, the, the first kind of piece of that puzzle was a retrofit project for a proof of concept. And so, you know, for, for this area, Urban, since, since you've got some kind of uh, more insight into this information. Could you kind of walk us through what this retrofit project looked like? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as you can imagine, you just don't wake up one day and say, gee, I want to move a complete field from one technology to another. And so there's always some, uh, you know, you got to kind of test your theory and test your hypothesis, see what the payout is. So 
In this case right here, what they did is they, uh, they, they cycled through the field. They knew there were improvements to be had. So they started a program where they went through and just through a round robin, one after another, cleaned all their orifice back to back as quick as they could. And not surprising, their LNU went down a little bit. And so they said, you know, there is an opportunity for improvement in measurement. And then what they wanted to do is, well, how do we qualify that? So they were able to isolate a small section that had, you know, a, a few different points that were all orifice. And they picked a certain pad that had some eight inch orifice on there. And they said, <laughs> well, let's see how this particular pad um, will affect, because they're able to really balance that little segment of their gathering system against what they're seeing. Now there were some other orifice meters feeding in, but they could see how this, they were able to see how the effects of changing up this one pad might be. So what they did is they uh, isolated it, they did some measurement on the orifice, and then they put in uh, some ultrasonics, and then they swapped an orifice and an ultrasonic, and eventually they did a complete <clears throat> ultrasonic at this pad. So they really were able to gather after a two week period a lot of comparisons from what it was when it was 100% orifice to 100% ultrasonic and kind of a mixture. And what was really telling here is for this one pad, they were able to extrapolate and say, the improvements that we're gonna see really came down to a, a return on investment in really quite a short time. And so they, they came up with a proof of concept, isolated, did their due diligence, determined there were gains to be had, showed there was a very nice return on investment, and then they got the approval to move forward. So the next slide, if you take a look at it, it kind of gives you a feel for what we're seeing on this slide right here, is that for this one little area, which of course had other sites than this just one pad, but when you went to this one pad and it was 100% orifice, they were at about three and a half uncertainty. And when they did all their testing and eventually got all ultrasonics in there, it dropped it by a little over 1%. And then some of the intermediate data where they had both ultrasonic and a mix of ultrasonic and orifice, uh, as you would expect, uh, uncertainty is a little bit higher. So in this case right here, remember, we didn't, uh, th this was just one pad on several pads uh, providing this information here, but they were to establish that, yeah, makes sense. Let's go forth. Very good, thanks. <clears throat> and so from there, um, you know, just what Irvin was walking through, uh, what you see is they needed to create a, a new measurement standard operating procedure that would be based on modular ultrasonic meter designs, you know, with the intent so that they could use those meter components uh, whenever they need in the very, very beginning. And then those components, those meters, could be reallocated as well pad production declines and so that they don't limit sunk cost into that facility. But one of the, the things that, that really surprised them uh, as they move forward was, you know, the company-wide LNU, they were targeting about a 1%. That's the information that they saw from the meter that they initially were looking at. But whenever they dove into the data and they started moving forward with this, they actually saw that there was a, a gain of a, around 2.5% from, from the, the loss reduction that they encountered. So whenever they started and, you know, they just started bringing on ultrasonic measurement. So you had ul ultrasonic measurement and orifice measurement. In the beginning was 2.44%. And as they progressed forward, where they were able to bring in additional higher volumes of ultrasonic meters, that began to reduce their unaccounted for to where what they were able to realize and see was it got down to a 0.07%, right? At a 0.1% loss. So that equated to significant benefits to that organization that we'll kind of dive into here, here, here in just a little bit. So what was some of the gains that they were able to document from the information that they saw? So from there, they, they really kind of had four different initiatives that they moved forward with. You know, one was the desire to leverage this technology to drive the increase in potential of unrecognized revenue. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a little bit. The second is increased operator utilization by implementing 
new measurement standard operating procedures and measurement guidelines, that they would be a, a true benefit for that. The third is efficiency in being able to utilize measurement capacities at near real time, okay? And, and then the last was a reduction of their operating expenses in transitioning from what they had been as far as a, prevented, a, a preventative maintenance type solution to a predictive maintenance philosophy. And so that all provided some value and we'll dive into that here a little bit too and a little deeper. So the first area, the initiative one is, is by leveraging technology. Uh, you know, we were looking at this graph earlier and, and what is this graph telling us? Well, for some organizations, uh, the way revenue is derived is revenue is based on the throughput. And you know, you take that throughput times a gathering fee, and, and that is really the essence and the driver of, of their, that organization's bottom line. Well, if you've got unaccounted for, well, that is unrealized, unrecognized throughput. And so just simply by going in and reducing the unaccounted for had the, the ability to increase revenue for that organization. So if we look right here, you know, if, if it would have stayed operating with conventional Orpus projected uh, volumes going through the fourth quarter of 2020, as compared to ultrasonic projected revenue for 2020, you can kind of see, well, I mean, how much of a difference is that? Well, if you look at, at the actual difference, that difference approaches $350,000 a quarter in unrecognized value and revenue to that organization. And that is just based on this specific field. And so as you can are able to grow that into other areas, there are additional potential benefits that your organization might would be able to derive from there. Their second initiative is was updating their company measurement standards and guidelines so that they could incorporate this technology in a more effective manner. And so one of those areas that they were able to do that is standardizing on a modular type design so that by doing that, they're able to reduce capital expenses. And so from there, you know, taking and looking at you know, money that you invest, you know, over a time period, if you're able to invest that from a modular type perspective, you're able to get a better return on your initial investment because you're able to reutilize and redeploy that investment as you go forward. And so this modular design allows for, you know, the majority of the sub costs that you've got to be eliminated through timely meter allocation. And so here's is a picture. It's a little, we'll let uh, Irvin go through this uh, kind of. Yeah, module. so this is a very similar header design that uh, the company ended up using and uh, at their pad meters. And, and really this was the foundation for them to realize all the benefits that Dwayne's been to talk and reduced LNU, the overall lower CapEx, the ease of relocating the meters, you know, lower OpEx and so on. We'll see this picture again and when we talk about some rangeability, but uh, right now, uh, you know, it really did meet their needs for the varying flow rates that you see in upstream production, as well as giving them insights to of course, operation, diagnostics, and the efficiency of their of their measurement. So next slide. So what we want to do is we want to move into a little more detail about the SICK ultrasonics and how those benef can benefit the upstream companies. You know, we'll go through a few more cases, each demonstrating how the SICK ultrasonic, you know, can not only can provide good measurement, then and not only how the diagnostics can provide information on the quality of the measurement. But how these diagnostics can be used to identify other issues that might be occurring in the facilities equipment related to that site. You know, after all, the, the, the sick ultrasonic is really just giving visibility into the pipe. It's not changing conditions in the meter run. You know, it's other external forces that are going to show up and cause changing uh, numbers in the diagnostics. So it's that relationship that can be looked at when you make um, when you start to incorporate in your operations, you can make it more efficient by looking at these diagnostics, what's going on, it can help you reduce the downtime, quite possibly save you a lot of money in, in the long run. So after all, like Dwayne said, wouldn't it be nice to identify immediately where the bad actors are occurring, whether it's a separator on a pad or something else causing you um, headaches in your, not only your measurement, but also in your system. 
and really, you know, being able to immediately act on that. And that's what this next case is going to talk about. So next slide, please. So in this case, we are going to look at really a tariff-driven uh, delivery uh, company and, and or gas gathering uh, system that was set up to deliver gas from producers, take it to the gas plant. And, you know, that pipeline expects to have dry gas. So uh, let's take a look and walk through this example. So next slide. So imagine you own a section of a gathering system along with in this pipe, you have several inputs. So you have different pads, some coming from the same company, multiple companies, maybe a few different ones, but all these guys are trying to get their produced gas down to the gas plant. And uh, of course, that's where you clean it up. And, uh, you know, gathering sisters systems are usually paid by transporting the gas. Now put yourself in the position of this gathering company. What you're seeing right here is they expect to have low moisture gas, but this red line um, is something that the producer saw. Really, the gatherer didn't have visibility at the site. The gatherer, their, their uh, point where they were accepting gas was about 25 miles downstream the, from the producer. But what you see is that particular gatherer on his own saw that he had a temperature alarm associated with the glycol. So that gather at around 820 dispatched someone to go take a look at it. Go to the next slide, please, Dwayne. Now on this slide right here, what you see is you start to map the blue line, which is the lower line. That's really what's going on at the delivery point. So eventually this gly glycol alarm where it starts to happen, you did start to see an increase at the plant, but it wasn't quite bad enough for them to say, you know, shut it in. Um, but you can see that moisture went up. And then it, uh, even though they fixed the glycol alarm, uh, the blue line still had an elevated level of moisture. So next slide, please. Interesting, at the pad, they had a sick meter. So let's take a look at these diagnostics and see what those diagnostics are showing you. Take a look at this, the green line, the one with the, the kind of spike in it. That occurred an hour before the red glycol alarm, clearly visible in the turbulence of the meter. Remember, the ultrasonic diagnostics just don't change on their own, but it's, you know, it's because something is going on in the pipe. And in this case, something has happened. So next slide, please. So looking more into what the ultrasonic, which was located at the meter where this glycol alarm, at the pad where the glycol alarm was, along with the turbulence, there's something else that was affecting the pass. So you can see the, the blue and the black and the, the, the red. Um, these are all diagnostics that are showing something's going on. Remember, this all happened an hour before the glycol alarm. What this is, is really a clear indication of, of kind of what liquids look like. So next slide, please. Um, in this one right here, when you combine it and not shown, uh, you have a diagnostic called speed of sound. It really, really does indicate that some sort of liquids and moisture was going through the meter. So the next slide. So putting this all together with all those diagnostics, incorporating the diagnostics into the into a total operational context, just instead of saying, that's measurement, that's measurement context. The meter was showing that liquid was being dumped into the gathering line. Now this was indicated four hours before the moisture at the plant exceeded their allowable, at which time the plant said, you know, shut it in guys. So what was the effect? This caused not only that one pad where the separator was being you know, was the bad actor. But remember, there are multiple other points that were injecting onto that line that they were gathering gas for. All those people had to be shut in while that line had to be picked and get, you know, so for about four hours before that moisture got high enough to where they had, the plant had to shut in that line, that thing was, you know, it was getting liquids. So in the end, they had to pig it. And as you can imagine, that was kind of expensive. So idea here is that incorporating diagnostics from an ultrasonic and an upstream make it much more efficient. You know exactly where the bad actor is and probably save a lot of money. So Dwayne? Sure. And so you know, speaking of, of the money side of that equation, Irvin, you know, you know, the question that you, you have to kind of ask yourself is what value can an ultrasonic meter bring to you and your organization? 
with issues that you were dealing with. And so, you know, is it hundreds of dollars? Is it thousands of dollars? Is it hundreds of thousands of dollars? And in this example, really, it was in excess of a million dollars that if they would have taken and acted on the information that the ultrasonic meter was telling them, they could have known that they had water inside this pipeline. And it was an issue that they needed to really address. They could have shut that meter in before the pipeline was ever saturated with water. And so saved a million dollars easy, easily right in that particular scenario. So as, as we go forward, you know, the other kind of area is allowing the ultrasonic meter technology to do the work also helps reduce your operational expense. You know, so if, if you take the remote diagnostics, you know, paired with the reliable transducers that you've got and transmitters that you have, uh, that provides a minimal upfront dollar cost that can then save you thousands, thousands of dollars on the downstream side of that. And so what we have seen is if you're able to use diagnostics, uh, that tells you really with a 99% degree of accuracy where problem actors, just like what, what Irvin was, was, was mentioning, problem actors, problem meters are, if you use those diagnostics based on the performance and the meter performance to find out where problems are. So if, if you use that to begin moving from a quarterly orifice type inspection to more of an annual ultrasonic meter inspection in the upstream area, then you're able to move more into a predictive maintenance philosophy. And you wonder, well, how much money could that actually save you? And if, if you just look at this particular example, you know, based on 12 meters, you know, based on 100 meters, based on 1,000 meters, what you're able to consistently see is about an 80% reduction in those operational expense costs by the time that it takes for the technician while they're out there, in addition to the number of trips that they spend in time traveling to the site. And so each site, each company, each facility is unique and different. This is just a simplistic type view of that, but from, from $6,700, to $1.1 million of being of savings that you might would be able to see based on the number of meters and how you deploy that information. And so that really kind of concludes this uh, initial type case study we wanted to walk through. But uh, Er and I were talking, we really wanted to bring in some additional case studies that, you know, really going back uh, to August 25th, uh, TJ McIntyre, which he's our account director for Upstream, in six process automation group, you know, along with Irvin, walk through several additional case studies that provide insight specifically in the area of upstream ultrasonic measurement. So if we look at, you know, transmission, uh, which is oftentimes referred to more on the midstream side, we've got upstream, we've got distribution and, and delivery, which is, is downstream. Each one of those different areas have their focus of what is important to them. You know, is it uncertainty? Is it turndown? Is it maintenance? Is it robustness? You know, there's each one has their own degree. But what you begin to see as you move forward is, you know, for us, we're, we're looking at the upstream area. And this is really kind of the focus that they really like to prioritize generally. But what you see is even turndown has a relationship to maintenance that has a relationship to uncertainty that also ties directly into robustness and reliability. And so as we walk through these, this first one, uh, Irvin, you want to kind of dive in and, and walk through this turndown illustration? Yeah, sure. So we're moving in. I don't know if this is what speed dating feels like, but uh, we're, we're wrapping <laughs> up here. and We've got a lot of slides in just a little bit of a minute. Sorry about this. So this is going to go pretty quick. So you, you seen this before we alluded to basically the idea of, of modular type designs. If you had an application that was uh, just in this kind of a little bit higher than what an orifice might want to run, these are different plots of an orifice to different size ultrasonics. You know, how would you handle this? Um, the next slide right here shows again that modular design and we talked about it. And so in this case right here, uh, again, this company, they use that so they could 
take that high initial production and really very easily handle that and then pull one off. So that way you're not stuck with a huge meter as time goes on and you're not having to buy another one. You pull one off and you reuse it on another well, another pad that might be coming on. So that, that's kind of a little bit about how this company handled the large turndown. You had eight inch pipes going through a couple of three inch simply because the turndown of three inch. The next one, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about maintenance. And this right here was uh, in a uh, bi-directional storage field. So gas goes in clean and dry, comes out not so much. And of course, I have a separator. That's that middle picture of that black horizontal separator. Uh, this particular customer was having a heck of a time getting stuff to balance. Uh, the, the formation would puke stuff up. It would overwhelm the separators. Separators were not being managed as well. Some of them were older. You take a look at the next slide. Um, you can kind of see what they did. It's coming out the separator. They put a DRU. And uh, in this case right here, since it's naturally bidirectional, it could measure the gas going in and out. And then, but really what's interesting is uh, the next slide. I just want to clarify something on the next slide. We, we all have heard probably in the beginning days that ultrasonics were very susceptible to liquid. I just wanted to let you know that's no longer the case. Um, it's not a, it's not a two phase meter, but they can handle liquid very well. Nothing gets damaged. And what happens is when that liquid passes, you're right back to where that measurement quality was. And so the question comes, well, how much can it take before you really start to lose measurement? So the, the red and blue line are the two paths showing how many signals made it across. And what happens is about a 97% gas volume fraction, we start to lose signal on that lower path. Well, what does this equate to? If you're at a 97, 98 gas volume fraction, that's about like you filling up a 400 barrel tank in 16 hours. So we're not talking about a little bit of misting. Ultrasonics can handle quite a bit of moisture and liquid before they start to really lose that lower path. Well, let's see how it looked like in the diagnostics on the next slide of what this operator in the storage field saw. But you can see to the left, the yellow, you know, they're cruising along and somewhere in the yellow, you see some bump. And that bump indicated something happened. And what I'll call actionable information, that information in the red, what you see is that's where some slugging started. So they knew that this particular site had an issue. They went there, shut it in, fixed the separator issue, started it up, and you see everything lined out really nice. Life was good. So this was a case where they knew exactly where to go. They knew which was the bad actor. The next slide right here is yet a third case where we talk about maintenance. Again, you know, everybody talks about clean, dry gas and, you know, it'd be really nice if you had it. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting back all fat and happy thinking I have a D high 100 feet upstream from my meter point. Hey, that's great. I have clean, dry gas coming off a D high. Well, that's not necessarily the case if the D high is not working right. So the next slide shows what can happen when the glycol and DI is not right. It's mixing with some of the formation liquids, creating this really nasty white sort of a salt emulsion mix. And so that's getting all over the inside of the pipe. If you can imagine that's going into the gatherer's pipeline, they're not going to be too thrilled. Well, let's look at what the ultrasonic was telling you. Remember, the ultrasonic is just telling you the next slide, please. On this slide right here, you can see the ultrasonics just telling you what's going on in the pipe. As it moves from the left to right, you start to see some of the diagnostics start to change. So that's a clear indication that something's going on. Well, the next slide right here, uh, because they were pulling those informations through SCADA, logged on remotely, and sure enough, this is what our software indicated. As you can see, yellow, there's some red on here. It's telling you something's going on. Well, the next slide, so they knew they went out there and as they mapped it in their SCADA system, you could see, I don't have time to go into it, but gain is one of the, the, one of the strongest indicators of contamination. You see where on the left, um, the gain was a little bit higher. It was running 40 something, they cleaned it. And then after the cleaning, the gain jumped right back down and they're all in line. Let's take a look at the next slide. And of course, the diagnostics in our software, everything's green, everything's happy. So in this case, by looking at the diagnostics, you're able to identify exactly where the bad actor was, 
even though it wasn't a measurement issue, the information from the field measurement point allowed that producer to go allow that gather to tell the producer, you need to resolve this or we're going to shut you in. And so that's just an example of how, you know, you can lower your maintenance, you know exactly where to go, you get an idea of the quality of the measurement. So there's just a lot of benefits and we're seeing, uh, of course, because of this, we're seeing more and more ultrasonics in the upstream market. So Dwayne, I think it's from here. From your... <laughs> Thank you very much, Irvin. As you can tell, Irvin and I are both passionate at whenever it comes to <clears throat> measurement integrity and, and taking and looking at ultrasonic meters in the upstream market. And so I, I would really like to, to say thank you to Irvin for sharing all the, the technical insight and information that he provided with us today and shared. In addition, I'd like to, 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 to say thank you to John Bachman. You know, John uh, shared some of the uh, information that, that he presented at a paper last year whenever we were actually going to conferences in schools in person, uh, but he was he presented last year during the Appalachian Gas Measurement Short Course, but he provided some of the information that we're able to bring to you today. But if, if you look at the benefits of a FlowSick DRU meter over an orifice, I don't want to go through each one of these because they all speak for themselves, but rangeability, you know, lower maintenance costs, you know, exceptional out of the box perform performance, low pressure drop, and diagnostics, diagnostics, diagnostics. And so this is all the information that we've walked through today. We've covered a ton load of ground. And so without any further ado, I would like to open it up and see if anybody has any questions that you would like to ask uh, Irvin or myself. Hey, Dwayne, we just have a couple to cover here. And I just want to remind the audience that, yeah, now would be a great time if you do have any questions to please pose those on the right hand side of your screen. And if for some reason we just aren't able to get to it today, we'll, uh, of course, have this information here that you can see on your screen for Irvin and Dwayne so you can contact them uh, after the presentation. So without further ado, let's go into that first one here, Dwayne. Um, it says, do you have a feel for how many companies are using ultrasonic flow meters in the upstream environment today? Great question. And so I, I would say uh, if we take and we look at relating specifically to flow measurement, measuring flow through an ultrasonic meter, uh, we there's right around a dozen that we've got that are using ultrasonic meters in flow measurement on the upstream side. And then if we extend that out a little bit more and we look at companies that are also on the upstream spectrum, but they are looking at flare measurement in addition to flow measurement, that would then extend and go to around the, the, the 30, the 30 number of customers. Great question. Anything else there? All right, great. Um, we do have one more at this time. Um, what do you feel the most important diagnostic would be to indicate carryover from a vessel? <laughs> you know, that, that sounds like a great question for Mr. Schwarzenberg. Yeah, so, you know, any single diagnostic by itself, and, and there's about five or six that uh, ultrasonics provide, but one of them is uh, speed of sound. And, and so on a multipath meter, uh, you know, speed of sound as gas is, is much higher mm -hmm. than speed of sound of uh, gas that might have moisture in it. And because generally gravity happens, that moisture is going to end up in the lower part of the pipe. So one of the dead giveaways is a separation of speed of sound between the multiple paths. Usually on clean gas, you expect them to be very close, but as you start to get moisture content, you usually see the lower pass with a slower speed of sound. So that's really the primary and secondary, you're gonna to wanna to look at like turbulence, uh, possibly gain, but, but usually you'll see it in speed of sound and turbulence. If it gets really bad, you'll start to see some of the signal acceptance being lost. Thank you. All right, we've actually had a few more come in. Um, the next one is, how do ultrasonics handle changing gas molecular weights, such as flare gas measurement? Oh, oh, I got that one. Oh, thank so, you. <laughs> the, uh, the speaker, receiver, and stopwatch. It's very, very simple. If I can get the, span, the sound wave across, then I can get a delta T. So I get that time difference, A to B, B to A. If I can get that time difference, irregardless of what's in the pipe, if it's light gas or heavy gas, if I can get that sound wave across, then I can calculate a velocity. If I can get a velocity, feet per second, 
times cross-sectional area, feet squared, I can get cubic feet. So what's so nice about ultrasonics is it's independent of really what's going down the pipe. Now what's going down the pipe can attenuate the signal strength. Again, that's where SICK has some really world-class transducers. So we're very efficient about getting that. So you're gonna find that our sensors are very, very good at getting that sound wave across. But ultimately, if the composition of the gas is to the point where either a combination of the molecular weight or the velocity of the gas. I'm talking to you across the room, you can hear me. I'm talking to you across the room in a hurricane. You probably can't hear me. Depending on the velocity of the gas, I may or may not be able to get that signal. So the gas composition is really independent. Um, it can prevent a signal from getting across, but if it changes within the normal composition of gas, we get the signal across, we can measure gas. Great. We've got two more if we can make it through. The next one is, is the accuracy plus or minus 0.33% of the range or measurement? It is of the measurement because in the range, you know, there's not a concept of scaling an ultrasonic. It is just measuring that time difference. So when we give accuracy statements that's of the reading usually the accurate statement will have two parts one is from q min to qt q minimum is what we generally put at the low end because if gas is not flowing very fast in a pipe it's just wandering around there's going to be high uncertainty not because the ultrasonic simply because the gas is not very repeatable it's influenced by thermal stratification and other things eventually you start to get enough flow in the pipe we call that transition, where we go from laminar to what we call turbulent flow in the pipe. Gas is much more formed up, much more repeatable. And then you'll see an accuracy statement for that, QT to Q max. And that's what we're talking about right there, is that that percent, whatever that uncertainty statement is, it is of that reading in those ranges. Great. If you think we have time, we do have one more question. And uh, for those of you whose questions we may not have gotten to, please feel free to contact Irvin or Duane. So this last question is, can the DRU be mounted vertical or the horizontal planes in the upstream gas applications? No, the, uh, it needs to be mounted vertical. Um, and not only vertical, what we see in the upstream, uh, you know, sometimes measurement in upstream applications is kind of like an afterthought. Um, just like taking a, a, a sensor off of a pipeline, if, if you're measuring pressure off a liquid line, you want that pressure transmitter below it. If you're measuring pressure off a gas line, you want it high. Why? Because you don't want stuff filling it up. So the impulse line. So in a world of an ultrasonic, same thing. If you're gonna be putting ultrasonic in, in an upstream, application you want to make sure that that's not going to be in in some sort of a low point in a gathering line because typically the amount of moisture that's involved in that um, will settle out to the lowest point in the system if that's where your measurement is that meter is going to fill up with liquid so then comes the question well can we mount it horizontally or something like that and we really can't do that because the way the transducers are milled and put into the pipe they're they're basically facing one is upstream and one is downstream so in a vertical type installation you're going to have moisture potentially dropping off and as that moisture gets on the pipe wall it can end up in what we call in the pockets around the transducer but the the technology itself doesn't matter if you had a clean dry application that you could guarantee 110 percent that you'll never have any liquid never have any trash or anything in there the ultrasonic sound doesn't care if it's going up or down, vertical or whichever way it goes. But the concern is, is that we don't have clean, dry gas. We can have moisture. That stuff can fall out. It can accumulate into the pockets and you can just create a huge maintenance issue. So in upstream applications with ultrasonics, uh, we like to see those mounted in a uh, horizontal plane. And please make sure the measurement point is not in some sort of a sump sitting on the ground just because it was a convenient place to put it. Great answer, Irvin. Awesome. Okay, that wraps up our time today with SICK. We hope you all have found this conversation insightful and educational. I want to thank you all for joining us here today and have a great rest of your day.
Right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.